I'm very honored to be here and very grateful to Marco Tamieto for making it possible. I think I have been uh, one of those who have known Larry for more years than most. Uh, in fact, I think uh, we know each other, for, we have known each other for about half a century. And, and I remember, uh, Carlo has mentioned this, I remember vividly when he came to Pisa, to the Scuola Normale Superiore, to lecture on uh, implicit or better unconscious learning in amnesics. And that was really uh, the beginning of uh, relations which I have enjoyed throughout my life. And uh, I always re regarded Larry as one of the most important figures in the development of uh, contemporary brain science and uh, neuropsychology. He is, I think he has stated very clearly that we can get two kinds of information. The behavioral information, of course, and then the information that the subject of the experience or the examination provides with uh, the so-called commentary about his or her own behavior. Uh, and, and Larry has never been afraid of saying that the commentary can somewhat be asked also of animals, because although we don't know much about the consciousness of animals, we uh, can certainly think that they have an inner life and some uh, feelings uh, similar to those that we also have. Uh, a, an English psychologist in 1989 wrote a very ironic uh, paragraph. He said that consciousness is a fascinating but elusive phenomenon. It is impossible to specify what it is, what it does, or why it evolved. Nothing worth reading has been written about it. My counter objection to this is that if he unfortunately died before there was and published his very sensible and practical book about consciousness, consciousness lost and found, perhaps Sutherland would have changed his mind. I like to show the influence of blind sight and indirectly of Larry on uh, the neuroscience by reporting the number of citations of the word consciousness in the textbook of uh, neuro neurosciences by Eric Kandel, perhaps the most famous uh, textbook on the neuroscientists, uh, neurosciences uh, today. And you can see that in 1981, consciousness was never mentioned. This was still the influence, the influence of the crazy period of behaviorism. And then we have six citations in 1985, seven in 1981, and an explosion in 2000. If you go and look at what happened, you see that blind sight is mostly responsible for this change of mind. The change of mind was that by the discovery of blind sight and other uh, phenomena in which behavior is not accompanied by awareness or consciousness, uh, neuroscientists were forced to use the word conscious and unconscious. Uh, there, there have been at least two more editions. I haven't bothered to count this citation there. Uh, in my title, the, uh, there are three words, uh, mind, brain, and body. 
I am convinced, of course, that mind and consciousness, which is part of the mind, is in and of the brain. But we should not forget that the brain lives in a body and is in continuous exchange of information and material and energy with body itself. And you can see that two great men of the 19th century, Darwin and James, they say that the body certainly participates at least in emotions and the feeling of emotion probably would not exist or would exist in a dif different form if the body did not contribute what um, Joe Ledoux has called the body feedback. But even today, there is evidence that apart from the emotion, the body can influence consciousness and consciousness can influence uh, the body. Uh, there is an expression which has been coined by Mike Corbelis, mental time travel. We know that humans can travel in time uh, before, in the past and in the future, and uh, apparently there is a timeline which is um, influenced by the body. Here is a, a cute experiment in which a subject is standing and the, uh, is a more leaning movement, the leaning forward and leaning backward are measured very precisely with, the, uh, with an error of a, a millimeter or so. And the subject is asked in one condition to think of himself or herself four years back in time, something that happened four years ago, and, uh, and in another condition is asked to think about of himself four years ahead of, uh, in the future. What could happen to him or to her in the future? And you can see that there is an increasing leaning toward in a forward when the subject is thinking about the future and an increased leaning toward the back when the subject is thinking about the past. Uh, so this is consciousness and thinking which influences the body. But there is also a reverse condition, a reverse experiment. You see this arrow, you should, should imagine them as moving continuously. On the left, there are arrows moving continuously toward the center. And on the right, there are arrows con moving continuously away from the center. And uh, it is known that if you sit and uh, steady, if you are steady, uh, but look at these stimuli, the first stimulus gives you an impression of uh, movement of vection, or backward vection, you feel transported backward, and in the other condition, you feel transported forward. And people, after the experiment, immediately after the experiment, subject as a, asked to report the content of their uh, wonder, mind wandering. And you can see in blue, that there is a prevalence of past thought when you are submitted to a vection toward the back, and, you, and there is a prevalence of red, that is, of future talk, of imagination of the future, when <clears throat> you uh, experience the opposite stimulus. Uh, there are two senses of the word. I think today it is very important to point these out. There are two senses of the word, conscious and unconscious. Uh, if we speak about blindsight and many other things that have been discussed today, what is conscious or unconscious can be an action or a percept or a thought, even a thought. 
uh, Mel Goudreil had spoken of conscious and unconscious actions, conscious and unconscious persons, and so on. Uh, but there is another consciousness, a consciousness of a person or an individual or even an animal. In veterinary medicine, it is uh, common practice to uh, judge whether a cat or a dog uh, which has been struck by a car is conscious or unconscious, exactly as in human medicine. So consciousness or unconsciousness as states of the individual. And in human medicine, you can see there are severe disorder of consciousness in which consciousness can be uh, lost, preserved in almost total form, or preserved in partial form. And uh, you can see coma. This takes me back to, the, to my young years when <clears throat> In Morussi's laboratory, we were working on the brainstem of the cat and finding out what was necessary for the cat to be wakeful, to be responsive, to perceive, in a sense, and act. And those in which he couldn't move, couldn't respond. And in humans, today we spoke about coma, as a condition of uh, loss of consciousness with absolutely no sign of waking. The eyes are closed, there are no movements, no uh, goal-directed movement. And coma is a very short condition. Usually uh, the patient dies or moves to another condition of uh, deranged consciousness. And I will focus on this one, locked-in syndrome, in which there is virtually no behavior, but there is consciousness, although it is very difficult to find it. The vegetative state is another condition in which there is waking, but probably no consciousness. And in the, we know today that a patient which has no, who has no behavior, who cannot communicate, but is apparently awake because the eyes are open, is not necessarily unconscious. The patient can, in the locked-in syndrome, communicate with very small residual movements, particularly in the region of the eyes, or in a vegetative state, uh, this is a very recent development, consciousness can be communicated through the activity of the brain. In other words, the patient can understand the instructions and generate patterns of brain activity voluntarily, which are very different. You can have two classes. This has been done by Adrian Owen in Cambridge. Uh, who, Owen is now in, um, in London, Ontario, Western Ontario, in Canada. And he has been able to show that in some patients, uh, apparently completely uncommunicative, uh, in a total vegetative state, there is nevertheless the ability to generate patterns of brain activity in response to instruction. And if you make up a code for communication where one pattern means yes and another means no, you can talk with the brain of the patient literally and find out if there is conscious or not. And in the locked-in syndrome, there are some residual movements, particularly 
eye movements in the vertical plane, because the lesion usually is at the level of the pons, and the sixth nerve is damaged, so there are no horizontal eye movements. This is a famous case of a journalist, French journalist who was thought to be in a vegetative state, uh, but then a nurse realized that he was moving the eyes and uh, asked him to move the eyes uh, in um, a certain number of times to mean that he understood. understood. And uh, eventually he was able to communicate through a code and he was able to write a book uh, which, which has become even a, a, a movie. This is another North American patient. Uh, again, uh, by using eye movements or by using sometimes eyelid movements, they can, for example, uh, look at, at a particular letter on a table and compose words and sentences. Uh, here in Italy, in Milan, Cappa and Vignolo several years ago were the first to try to do a neuropsychological examination of a patient in a locked-in syndrome. And uh, you can see that they were able to uh, give many tests, neuropsychological tests, to him, and he was virtually normal. He was able, uh, both verbally, in, on verbal and visual spatial tasks, even though he had been uh, in 12 years unable to communicate and almost total deafferentation. The other thing which is curious, I mean, it's, uh, it's difficult to understand for people who can move, is that although patients in the locked-in syndrome, uh, of course, are aware of their, of their enormous handicap, are not actually, they, they know that uh, they are not actually, they want to live, they want to live. And provided there is no physical pain, they are not totally disconnected. Provided there they are no uh, physical pain, they have no suicidal thoughts, or, and they don't require to be euthanized in, in countries that allow euthanasia. This is a, a more recent case studied in Cambridge by Barbara Wilson. And uh, there is the, the patient signals, the, the examiner uh, says aloud the colors, orange, red, yellow, blue, green, and so. And the, the patient moves, knows what letters and numbers are in the respective colors, and moves the eyes uh, when the right color is, is uh, pronounced by the examiner. And then the examiner reads the content of, the, of that particular stripe, and again, an eye movement signals a number or a, a digit or a letter. And this patient has been able to communicate, and you can even see in the last answers that they have a sense of humor. This is a young lady who was married, and uh, she has a, she's uh, uh, conscious, aware of the state in which she is, but also she has adjusted to the state. I see things differently. I don't get angry by things anymore. On the grand scale, things really don't matter. What are your hopes for the future? And then, is there anything you miss? I miss being able to jump out of bed in the morning. I don't miss doing the ironing. Now, these uh, uh, patients have virtually no control over the, uh, the, the muscle in the facial reg region if you exclude the eyes and sometimes the eyelids. Uh, 
what about their ability to read the emotion? There is a theory that says that we can understand the emotion in a photogram of a face, for example, because we tend to imitate the face, and this imitation provides a body feedback that aids the recognition. So first, during emotional recognition, an observer mim mimics an expression, presumably in a subtle and covert manner. Second, facial feedback generates the corresponding emotional state in the observer. Third, the observer understands or classifies the emotion he or she is experiencing as the emotion expressed by the other person. And you can see here that even voluntary contraction of the frown muscle or of the smile muscle uh, can influence the ability with which uh, facial expression are recognized. In other words, if you contract the frown muscle voluntarily, you are better at recognize negative emotion. And if you contract, if you contract the smile muscle, you are better at recognizing positive emotion. A group of uh, neurologists and uh, neurosurgeons, I believe, uh, in Cassino, south of Rome, has done, in, in, led by Francesca Pistoia, including uh, Dario Grossi and Troiano and other neuropsychologists, they have done an, an analysis of the ability with which uh, locked in patients who are unable to control their muscle are able to recognize uh, facial emotion in photographs. And you can see that the only difference is a difference in the positive emotion. They are, in, uh, excuse me, in the negative emotion. They uh, show an handicap in recognizing the positive, in the negative emotion, whereas uh, the non-negative, since positive and neutral emotions were uh, the same, provided the same results, they were pulled, put together, and you can see there is no difference, and there are no difference for other things. In other words, it looks as there, Damasio has uh, suggested that uh, a neurophysiological explanation of this surprising serene attitude to our life of locked in patients could be due to the fact that this patient, patient missed the body loop or body uh, feedback component because of the deafferentation at the level of the, of the pons. Uh, he says that any mental process which would normally induce an emotion fails to do so through the body loop mechanism. The brain is deprived of the body as a theater for emotional realization. And on the basis of the previous results, I think we should say that probably this applies to the, uh, negative, uh, to the negative emotion because the positive emotion can be experienced without the body uh, feedback. Now let's go back to the possible animal models. Uh, as I said, in my young days, we had uh, physiological evidence that one could reproduce a coma in, in the cat, for example, uh, by uh, cutting uh, the brainstem at the level of the midbrain or even by lesioning the ascending projection of the reticular formation at this level. Uh, the, uh, pre-collicular or intercollicular level. But then uh, Moruzzi found, that, and of course, in this preparation, the brain has only two inputs, the olfactory nerve and the optic nerve, and uh, only one output, 
the third nerve, the oculomotor nerve. If you make a lesion at the middle of the pons in front of the emergence of the three geminal nerve, the fifth nerve, the preparation is quite different. Now, the animal not only is not comatose or uh, uh, not waking and so, but on the contrary, uh, perhaps there is conscious awareness based on the fact that the EG is desynchronized during 78% of the recording time, as opposed to 27% of cats with an intact brain. Vertical pursuit eye movements of the eyes. If you move something in front of the cat, the cat follows as a, a movement, uh, up and down movements. If you present the stimulus repeatedly, there is habituation, which is an indication of some low-level learning. If you show a mouse or a rat, there is pupil dilation, possibly in response to an emotional stimulus. If you move a stimulus near the animal, there is accommodation of the, of the, of the lens. There is Pavlovian conditioning of pupil dilatation. And the interesting thing is that there is operant conditioning of the eye movements for rewarding brain self-stimulation. Uh, we know for, from the 1950s that uh, intact animals, including cats, can respond to stimulation of selective points in the brain by liking, so to speak, the for, by searching the stimulation, by self-stimulation, if they are given the chance. And when the elector is in another position, they will do everything to avoid the stimulation if you allow them. So uh, you can have self-stimulation in, in certain points in the brain, and or you can have, in theory, you can have the animal in interrupting the stimulation because apparently uh, it, it's not, uh, he doesn't like it. Like and not like may not be appropriate word, uh, although maybe Ed Rolls would subscribe them, not Joe Ledoux. Uh, what happens if uh, we have an electrode in a uh, in a center which an, an intact cat gives self-stimulation and you give the cat, the mid-pointing cat, a chance to self-stimulate by moving the eyes. You can do this by stimulating after each ocular movement and you can see that what happens here you have. This was done uh, this is, these are experiments in the um, late 70s and the 1980s. I report them because nobody knows them. And these were done by a Japanese, Hiroshi Kawamura, who went back to Japan after spending a couple of years in Pisa. And you can see during the stimulation of different voltages in the dark, if you couple the, the stimulation in the lateral hypothalamus, which is a reward area, with the eye movement, after the eye movement you give the stimulation, the frequency of the eye movements will increase, will increase more if you increase the voltage of the stimulation. And if you turn on the light, when the animal can see, will increase even more. And uh, he, had, he made a, a control. He had another mid-pointing cat, uh, which received the same stimulation at random because the stimulation was controlled by the eye movements of the other cats. So there was no temporal relations between the eye movements of the controlled cats and the stimulation, and you see that there is no increase in the eyes. But the interesting thing is the following. This is another thing. 
They also tested, uh, Kawamura with a uh, co-worker tested midpoint in cats with aversive brain stimulation by stimulating in the depth of the superior colliculus. That is with stimulation which are actively avoided by cats with intact brain. Surprisingly, when we pontine preseminal cats were given the opportunity to turn off such stimulation by inhibiting eye movements, in other words, the, uh, the negative stimulation was applied after each eye movement, the frequency of eye movements did not decrease. Actually, it increased a little bit, but not significantly. And they made another experiment in the encephalisolate cat in which the full brain stem is attached to the brain in which the supposedly aversive brain stimulation associated with contraction of the facial mus muscles had the more passive avoidance effects on eye movements. In other words, the uh, encephalisolate cats, which had a connection with the body, both uh, afferent and efferent, they were very active in avoiding the, the content. And so, uh, in a sense, we can say that the, this, the midpointing cats of Ikegani and Kawamura resemble the human locked in patients who were inclined toward positive emotion more than negative emotion. And actually, they specifically propose that the Mipolentine Presigeminal Cat could represent an animal model of the human locked in syndrome. This is just to say that the, although, of course, the consciousness in animal is probably very different than consciousness in humans, it is possible to make experiments in, in animals in which we can ask questions about relations be, uh, between parts of the brain and behavior that can suggest a control of the animal and possibly some, if I am allowed, some feelings of the animal. And I will stop here because it's already very late and I would like to leave some time for the questions and discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs>